Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's work group on the implementation of the Innovative Small E-Fleet Pilot Project for fiscal year 2023 to 2024. The program is called ISEF for short. My name is Brianneth Rocha, and I'm an air pollution specialist with the California Air Resources Board, and I am the new CARB staff lead for the ISEF project. I'm joined here today with several other CARB staff and our partners at CalSTART to share the implementation changes that align with the board approved fiscal year 2023 to 24 funding plan for the clean transportation incentives. We will now take a moment to go around and introduce staff. Would like to, Bruce, go ahead. Start. I'm Bruce Tudor, uh, supervisor in the um, mobile source uh, control division overseeing the ISEF program. Uh, how about Brandon? Hi, I'm, I'm Brandon Rose, air pollution specialist. Um, been at CARB a long time. I've been doing the case by case for the last year and a half or so with ISA. If there's no one Nikki? else from CARB, I'll jump in. Sure. My name is Nikki Okuk, and I'm with CalStart. We are the administrator for the California HVIP program. Um, and myself and Brittany work specifically on this ISEF set aside. Brittany? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Brittany, like Nikki introduced, um, and I'm the project manager um, over at CalStart for this ISEF program. And we have one more ARB person, uh, Amory Rogers. She's being shy. We should move on. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. There you are. Okay. Hi. Anne-Marie Rogers. I'm the branch chief for compliance assistance and outreach. And I just want to thank everyone for being here. All right, everyone. Thank you for sharing. Um, now, before we get started, a little information on the work group logistics. Today's work group is going to be recorded and a copy of the recording and a list of the group attendees will be posted on CARB's low carbon transportation web webpage within the next couple weeks. Today's work group is really intended to be a conversation and throughout the morning we will pause for questions and comments. At that time, we will ask that you raise your hand to let us know you're ready to share your question, your question or comment. CARB staff will then unmute you and those participating via phone, please press number two to raise your hand. We'll remind you of these instructions throughout the work group. And as always, we appreciate your patience if we run into, into any technical glitches. If you'd like to follow along with the presentation, you can find the slides in the link shared in the chat right now. Next slide, Nikki. Thank you. We will start off today by going over some background information for ISEF, followed by a review of the 2022 to 2023 funding year. We will then discuss updates of, for the 2023 to 24 funding plan. Then we will discuss our proposed implementation changes and open the floor to feedback and ideas for implementation from participants. Finally, we'll wrap up and discuss timeline and next steps for the program. I want to emphasize that this work group is focused on implementation and that we'll provide opportunities to discuss potential policy changes in future work group meetings as part of the funding process. Next slide. Um, Nikki, next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Now a little for some back, sorry, now <laughs> some background information on ISEF. ISEF was set, set up as a set aside within the Clean Truck and Bus Voucher Incentive Project, HVIP, in 2022 to 22, 2021 to 22 funding plan. HVIP as a whole was designed to accelerate market transformation by reducing the purchase price of zero emission technologies, and it is the cornerstone of CARB's advanced technology heavy duty incentives for on-road zero emission technologies, including battery electric, fuel cell, and electric power takeoff. 
The ISAF set aside was designed to help small fleets and independent owners slash operators overcome barriers in the ZEV market, in ZEV market entry, and the pilot incentive mechanisms such as all inclusive leases, peer to peer truck sharing, and truck as a service agreements. The transactions within ISAF have involved three parties, which include the ISAF provider, an HVIP approved dealer, and the eligible small fleet participant. The eligible small fleet participants include entities with 20 or fewer vehicles operating in California, making less than 15 million in annual revenue. Next slide, please. And this slide lays out HRIP's funding allocation for 2023 to 2024 fiscal year. This is on top of what is remaining in HVIP from fiscal year 2022 to 2023. As of February 2024, there is 19 million from fiscal year 22 to 23 and fiscal year 21 to 22. For 2023 to 24 fiscal year, an additional 14.3 million has been set aside for ISAF projects. Standard HBIP has about 200 million still available. And you can visit HBIP's funding page for regularly updated totals, which is provided in the link shared right now. Okay, next slide. Thank you. Now, the, now to recap the current fiscal year. While several ISAF vouchers are still in process, I will give a brief breakdown of the vouchers that were requested in the second year of the pilot program. As a reminder, ISAF offered a double voucher amount and these are the results. ISAF continued to exceed expected demand. The original 35 million included in the funding plan was ultimately increased to $85 million to meet the demand, with 50 million being allocated for small fleets looking to purchase zero emission trucks. Last year, ISAF saw $111 million requested overall, about 61 million was for standard HVIP requests and 37 million for provider requests. This does not include those requests that were ultimately canceled. Um, we did see 50, 52 unique fleets applied, of which 78% were located in domi were domiciled in disadvantaged communities. The average size for fleets that applied for ISAF were of five vehicles, which is consistent with the first year of ISAF. Of the requests, 357 of those projects were voucher requests for standard vehicle purchases. Purchases, 192 were for the truck as a service model, and 11 were for leases, 25 for rentals, 53 for financing agreements, and 28 for providers. Many ISA vouchers are still in the ver in the verification step or are in the final stages of redemption. So this. Um, information is constantly updated. Next slide, please. Thank you. Now we will discuss updates to the ISAF brought upon by the board approved fiscal year 2023 to 24 funding plan for clean transportation incentives. The biggest change, the biggest change to HVIP and ISAF is that H will HVIP will now offer even more support to small fleets. Since the, since the establishment of ISAF, demand has far exceeded funding. To help with that demand and further serve California small businesses, HVIP will now align with the HVIP. HVIP will now align itself with the small fleet definition that ISAF has been using and will raise purchase, purchase incentives in HVIP to match the incentives amount in ISAF. One of the key lessons learned from ISAF is that small fleets need continuous access to funding for zero emission vehicles. This would result in HVIP offering the double the lease, <clears throat> the, sorry, double the base voucher amount for fleets with fewer than 20 medium or heavy duty vehicles and that have less than 15 million in annual revenue. All standard purchases formally made through ISAF will now be funded through HVIP, 
following allowing HBIP to focus on innovative solutions for small fleets. Next slide. The board also approved the expansion of ISF eligible vehicles to include certain buses that are commonly used by small businesses, such as daycares and retirement homes, that, <clears throat> so that these small businesses can also take advantage of the innovative, innovative mechanisms like bus as a service and peer bus sharing. All class 2B through class 8 vehicles are eligible for ISF funding, including buses. If the fleet is eligible for school bus funding, it is not eligible for ISEF. ISEF has, although ISEF does have 1.125 billion currently available for the local education agency school bus replacement grants, and which you can find in the HBIB vehicle catalog. Next slide, please. Thank you. Small fleets. Small, small fleets are now defined through HRIP as fleets with 20 or fewer medium and heavy duty vehicles and less, and that make less than 15 million in annual revenue. HRIP previously recognized small fleets as fleets with 10 or fewer vehicles. The change in small fleet definition will apply to all uses of the definition. For example, small fleets located in disadvantaged communities receive a 15% increase with the disadvantaged community voucher modifier. For drayage fleets, there is a 25% increase with the drayage early adopter modifier. And there's also a refuse modifier that provides a 25% increase. Additionally, small fleets are eligible to stock or combine HBIP vouchers with most of other state funding sources. And as always, all fleets can stack HBIP with other fund, federal or local funding sources. When, when stacking funding, there is funding sources that must allow the stacking, which, let me clarify. When stacking funding, the other funding source must also allow stacking with HBIP. So just a reminder that ISEF is not eligible for port plus ups and that requests Requests from fleets with 20 or fewer vehicles are also now exempt from existing, the existing manufacturer rolling soft cap limit. Next slide. Consistent with the advanced clean fleet regulation for standard HVIP and all set asides except for the public bus set aside, HVIP's fleet size definition for voucher requests placed on or after January 1st, 2024, will be inclusive of the fleet vehicles domiciled anywhere globally and that are over 88,500 8, pounds GWR, including all such vehicles under common ownership or control, as defined in HVIP's implementation manual. Common ownership or control has been defined in HVIP as fleets that are being owned by by the same person, corporation, partnership, and limited liability company or association. In addition, vehicles managed by the same people are also considered under common ownership and control. Next slide. So let's take a pause here and open for questions on the funding, funding recap for last year and for the 2023 to 2024 funding updates. My colleague, Brandon Rose, will now um, continue on to this slide. All right. Um, feel free. We have a second half of the presentation, but feel free to raise your hand if you have a question about what we just talked about. Uh, I see you, Lisa McGee. Let me go ahead and unmute you. Go ahead, Lisa. Hi, I just had a question about, um, oh, Lisa McGee from Tom's Truck Center. On the soft cap exemption, it is it is it changed now to 20? Thank you. Can you answer that? Yes. It's changed from it's changed to 20 instead of 10. Previously it was 10. So does the VPC now reflect that in the report or is it different? Because it still states to be 10 in the report. 
Yeah, I think that's just, um, I'll get that updated in the VPC, but it will be reflective. Okay, and when will that be? Um, I can let you know, it should be pretty soon. Fairly okay. soon, we should be able to do it today. All right, thank you. That was it. All right, thanks, Lisa. Um, and then uh, next we have Michael Terreri. Um, let me go ahead and I'll go ahead and unmute yourself. Go ahead and identify yourself. Wonderful, thank you. Has the program evaluated the change in spend rate by expanding uh, eligibility to include public agency fleets and vehicles class two B and above? Uh, specifically, their projected um, day of depletion for funds. Michael, you cut off a, a little bit at the very end there. Could you say that again? Sure. Is there an estimated date for funds to be spent with the new eligibility changes? Any sort of projections or estimates based on the eligibility change? Um, Nikki, can you answer that? Yeah, I mean, the biggest change mentioned, right, is that straight purchases have moved over to standard HVIP, where we have a large pool of funding still available, about $200 million. And, um, But I will say that over the last couple of months, we've had fairly high levels of voucher requests, um, close to $100 million every month. So I would, as always, recommend that if you are prepared to issue a purchase order and submit a voucher request uh, sooner rather than later is better because it is possible that we could expend um, HVIP and ISAF funding by the end of, say, the summer. Thank you. I am not seeing any other hands up. Give it a moment. All right, see, um, uh, Layla, I'm, I'm not going to pronounce it. Layla, let me go ahead and unmute you and uh, introduce yourself. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, there we go. Hi. Uh, my question is, uh, first of all, I have a few questions. I am receiving a lot Layla, of... could you uh, just say who your, your affiliation, your name and affiliation? Yeah. Um, I registered my company two years ago. I am presenting first time uh, most innovative technology. It is light piezo crystals. The only one uh, soft piezo uh, in the world. Uh, which produce electricity under any kind of pressure, vibration, motion. So embedded into the tires, they produce electricity uh, with much less amount of heavy packs of batteries and uh, produce electricity inside of car without needs of uh, uh, charging, recharging station infrastructure. And as I mean, not so many. And of course, without heavy packs of batteries. Batteries can produce many, many uh, challenges to solve, special mobility, flammability, and so on and so on. I'm a chemist. I know what I'm saying. So I am receiving a lot of email from Office of Energy uh, and, of course, from different uh, different companies, uh, from uh, CIR. I am receiving every day at least two, three uh, emails. I uh, wrote to them about that. I introduced something and they want me to, to apply. First, my question is, is this project only for uh, California-based companies in US? Or because I, am, I have two citizenship, it is uh, Israel and uh, Canada. And um, now there are new program for uh, specialists in some areas, and I am included. So it will be much easier for me. Uh, the special program just uh, just came up. I mean, maybe six eight months, and already few, uh, many people are already there. So it is what I am saying. First of all, this question, uh, this project only for US and or specifically for California companies based because I have to know where to re it's registered in um, Israel and, uh, and um, Canada because uh, Israel did uh, this project uh, started maybe 15 years ago with NASA. Uh, it was now allowed to talk about that. It was, it was closed that topic. Uh, it is very new. Uh, I have my so, website 
Do you want us to go ahead and respond to that? Yeah, who can respond? You know, I can I can take a, a shot at that, Lala. Um, so I think that the 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 real meat of the question is is this only open to California companies? It's not. However, uh, there are requirements that you operate at least fifty percent of the time in the state. Um, additional, <clears throat> pardon me. Additionally, uh, you have to be registered with the California DMV, so your vehicle has to be registered here. Um, which you could you could dual plate if you were registered outside of the state. Um, and also, in addition, you have to be registered with the Secretary of State uh, as a business operating in California. Uh, again, there are some there are some requirements, but basically, it is open to anyone as long as you meet those requirements. As uh, okay, what what kind of requirements? I mean, project, yeah, it means, or well, not as far as a project. It really just comes down to: Are you operating in the state? Do your trucks operate in the state? Again, for that specific amount of time, at least fifty percent time, uh, fifty percent of your miles have to be spent in the, have to be driven in the state, and then, as I said, registered with DMV and uh, um, and registered with the Secretary of State, and of course, the vehicle has to be uh, purchased from an authorized uh, HVIP dealer or or through an authorized uh, uh, entity. So if, for example, I register a company in another state, it is not enough. I have to register also in California. That's that's correct. Uh huh. So in California, it must be registered as well. Okay. Okay. And uh, you will give later your uh, email information. Maybe uh, I can contact with uh, you to with Bruce or somebody. Uh, so I think there's some contacts on the last slide. Is that yes. right? Yes. Yes. There's contact information at the end of the presentation. Ah, in the end, okay, because I had in 20 minutes another webinar. Okay, we uh, can so, drop it in the chat, Lena. Yeah, okay, so it will be some information, emails or something, so how I can contact you. Because in general, it is first name, last name, and uh, airb.gov, let's see, something like that, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then next we have uh, James Tong. Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and announce your name and affiliation. Hi, James Tong with Advanced Grid Consulting. Um, so I have two questions. I, I'll do the first one, which is related to a previous question about the DAC bonus. Now, under the previous rules, my understanding is that it, it has is only eligible for fleets with ten or fewer vehicles, and now it's now is eligible for twenty or fewer vehicles. But if you had applied uh before you know that rule change under ICEF for for fleets that say size 15 will that DAC bonus be eligible for that for for that fleet or do we have to then resubmit that's a good question thank you um Brendan are we making that exemption going forward Brittany I'm it's probably the best suited answer oh, yes, that Brittany. Yeah. Brittany yeah I can help here um, so DAC is not going to be retroactively applied if your fleet does fall under 20 now. Uh, so if you did submit voucher requests um, prior to 1117, then you're probably going to want to cancel and reapply so that you can get the disadvantaged community um, additional funding. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. And, and then so we have to do the same process then if we want to get that DAC bonus. And Okay. Uh, then, yeah, go ahead. James, can, can I ask a question? And maybe I just misunderstood what you said. Did you say you had applied for ICEF or you had applied for HVIP? I, we I we applied that. for I ICEF. With the, and our, our understanding was that because it's a small fleet, um, you know, it would be eligible for the DAC bonus. But then we were told that, no, it's only small fleets with 10 or fewer vehicles, which was the HVIP standard. Uh, so there was kind of two definitions yeah. of what a small fleet was, and that created confusion okay. for us. That's what I missed. Okay, thank you. Right. So basically, what I'm hearing now is to get the DAC bonus, you would have to cancel those vouchers and reapply. Okay. Um, I guess the other question I have is a, a separate topic. It was there's there's a, a company that 
it's I, I think it's a leasing provider that purchase vehicles, uh, register them under their company name. They insist that they're still HVIP eligible because they've never applied and their mileage is below whatever threshold, I think 3,500 miles. Uh, and we just want to confirm if, if that's the case, if, if, if HVIP allows for a vehicle that's been, already been registered, not, not to an end user, but to the company that, that is leasing vehicles and, and, and has never applied to HVIP before. Hey, I'll jump in on this one. <clears throat> so HVIP rules do say that HVIP vouchers cannot be requested for vehicles that have already been you know, delivered, registered, or as you said, had more than 3,500 miles on them. <clears throat> Interestingly, though, a little bit later in this presentation, we are uh, bringing up a recommendation or a proposal to potentially allow um, us to set vouchers for um, what we would in this case consider a used or secondary market vehicle uh, that may have been previously registered or, or used by another fleet. So we are considering it. It's something we'd love to hear you weigh in on a little later in the presentation, but as of this moment, HVIP rules prohibit it. Okay, thank you. All right, perfect. Um, I think we have one more hand up and I think then we'll go on to the second half of the presentation. Uh, I have uh, Marissa Brown. Go ahead and unmute yourself and give your name and affiliation, please. Hi, folks. Um, Marissa Brown from the Greenlining Institute. Um, thank you for the presentation. Do you mind going over the 2023 to 2024 20, uh, funding updates again? Um, it was just a little unclear. Yeah, yes, we can go over them again. So, just looking for the slide here. Is it this one, Marissa? You were looking for what was left over from last year and what's coming next year, or were you looking at the, you were asking about the slide with the actual changes and sort of rules around the funding plan? Um, so the former, this one, what's left over from last year and then what's uh, what funding we have for this year. Yeah, can you go over this slide again? Okay, this slide, all right. Yes, so, this so this slide um it does show the 2023 to 2024 fiscal year and in terms of what's remaining in HVIP from fiscal year 2022 to 2023, um as of this month there are 19 million left over from fiscal year 22 to 23 and 21 to 22. So over the past couple of years we still have 19 million from then, and in terms of what's coming in for fiscal year 2023 to 24 there will be 14.3 million set aside for ISAF and that's separate from what standard HVIP has which is 200 million available does that help clarify Marissa yes and then can you okay so I see 14.3 million and then yeah that that clarifies. Thank you so much. Of course. Yeah, I think this speaks somewhat to the previous question we'd gotten about whether or not we thought we were going to be running out of funding. So within standard ISAF, we're working through this 19 million that's sort of left over. Um, we've we've long exceeded the initial allocation. There was a uh, quite high demand early on, but there's been some cancellations. So we have some funding. We're still accepting applications. No problem there. Uh, then when we reopen, this additional 14 million will become available and we'll have time to accept applications and work through that for quite a while. But there is there is always the possibility that if there is very high demand, we'll be completely out, you know, I had said maybe by the end of the summer. Um, again, this is all funding that's for only the innovative um, opportunities in ISA. So this is all the things we've thought of like rentals, all-inclusive leases, truck as a service, things like that. So this is where all those provider uh, applications are going to be. This is where all of those um, sort of unusual uses of vouchers are going to be. Um, if you're just a small fleet and you're just looking to do a straight purchase, um, that's now going to be done out of that much larger pot that Brianna had mentioned. The 200 million pot in HVIP has double vouchers available for 
all fleets less than 20 of less 20 or less, which is public fleets, private fleets. Um, so just keep that in mind. If you're doing straight purchase, there's a much larger pot. If you're doing some one of these more innovative strategies, it's these two pots combined. It's what's left over from last year plus what's coming forward. Hope that makes it clear. Yeah, thank you, Nikki. And we, it seems we have no, oh, Marissa, do you have another question? Yes, I do. So back on that slide, I think my question here is the, so I'm looking at the 80 million for drage trucks. So for innovative small fleets, um, I'm seeing that drage trucks also get that voucher increase. So um, drage trucks are receiving money through innovative small e-fleets and then they also have that 80 million um is that under HVIP? yeah Brittany can you go through the ISEF modifiers and yeah so for ISEF uh the 25 percent the um drayage um additional funding will apply just not the Port of LA or Port of Long Beach funding. That's just gonna be accessible through, if it's just gonna be a standard purchase through each bit. Does that help clarify? Um, not really. So what is the 80 million? Um, is that coming from the HVIP 200 million funding? The 80 million is, um, again, another set aside within HVIP intended to fund drayage trucks first. So it is used for things like those drayage plus ups, which are statewide. Um, and then I know this is a bit confusing, but there is like an additional bit of funding that's coming from just the Long Beach and Los Angeles port. So that's only for those port uh, San Pedro drayage trucks. They can receive additional funding, but it can't be added on with our ISEF program here. So I know we keep saying drage, port, and it sounds like it's the same, but the drage set aside that you saw is part of HVIP. It is statewide. It allows us to add that 25% enhancement um, for all drage fleets. But down in Southern California, there's a special additional funding only available for small fleets operating in those San Pedro ports. And they cannot use ISEF to do that. They'll just need to do a straight purchase through HVIP. They do get a double voucher if they're a small fleet and they get the drayage plus up and they get port funding. So it's a very good time to for drayage drivers in the ports of San Pedro and Long Beach to be thinking about purchasing electric vehicles using HVIP. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you. It seems we have no more questions and there will be another pause for comments and questions in a few slides. So we'll be moving on to the next slide right now. Nikki, can you put the next slide, please? Thank you. So now we'll continue on to the service agreement requirements as well as proposed changes for the provider cap and voucher cap and the proposed addition for a used truck voucher pro pilot program. And as always, we are open for feedback and proposals. Next slide. Now for the service agreement requirements. As shown in the slide, a service agreement between the provider and the small fleet will be required at the time of terms and conditions being signed. Required doc documentation in the service agreement includes the following. Um, vehicle quantity and description, lease slash rental terms, vehicle vehicle domicile address, fees associated with the rent rental lease rental lease or truck as a service agreement, um, responsible party for the insurance, as well as any complimentary services offered. Yes, um, this is um, we just wanted to clarify the service agreements, and we can now move on to the sec. The next slide. So we have received public feedback with suggestions for several changes. First, we the first one we'll go over is there has been a proposal that we modify the voucher cap. I mean the provider cap, sorry, the clarified provider cap. Currently, as per the IM, a provider may request a maximum of 20 vehicles. Vehicle requests beyond the li these limits are submitted and are evaluated 
on, on a case by case basis. In feedback we received, um, it, a stakeholder suggested that the case by case review is unnecessarily burdensome. However, um, from our perspective, the process does, does provide flexibility for our program administrators. And I'm going to go over the rest of the suggestions and we will open for comments later on in the slides. So another recommendation we received is to change the limits to the amount of funds that a provider receives um, that a provider can secure rather than the amount of vouchers. Additionally, there's also a proposal to lift the voucher cap of 90% of vehicle costs. ISAF vehicles are part of the, um, sorry, ISAF, P ISAF vehicles are part of a project that includes energy, I'm sorry, okay, I'll go over it again. Additionally, there is a proposal to lift the voucher cap of 90% of vehicle costs if an ISAF vehicle is part of a energy storage or shared charging infrastructure accessible to multiple small fleets that have committed to moving to EVs under HVIP existing guidelines. So the suggestion is to lift this, this voucher cap or remove it if um, an ISAF fleet, a fleet eligible for ISAF meets these requirements for energy and infrastructure um, suggestions. We will uh, pause for questions and comments shortly. So next slide, please. And now for the, now for the proposed used truck voucher. This would serve as a pilot under ISAF. What it would be is that the proposed the purpose would be to collect data, support residual value, as well as accelerate a secondary vehicle market. The, the voucher would provide second life vehicle support as an alternative innovative solution to small fleets, making the switch to a zero emission vehicle. And the process for this voucher would require a seller to submit a request with CARB. Um, at the moment, the voucher amounts and guidelines would need to be uh, determined. So we're open to hearing your thoughts on it. Next slide. Now we can think, yeah, we can pause for additional questions and comments on the proposal changes as well as the new pilot idea. Go ahead and put your raise, use the raise hand button in Zoom if you, have to comment or a question, please. Not right. Hi, Lisa, go ahead. Okay, so my first comment, I just actually is a question uh, related to the used truck voucher. Can you clarify the definition? Is this an existing ZEV or is this a repower? Yeah. Um, start with. Yes, uh, Nikki, can you go back one slide? Thank you. So the I, we bring this up as a general concept at the moment, and we're looking here to get some feedback on some ideas you may have. So it will be in the development stage at the moment. Um, Carl, sir, do you want to comment on it? Yeah, to Lisa's question, it would have to be a vehicle that had been eligible in HVIP at some point, right? So it, we wouldn't be wanting to fund any other ZAVs or repowers outside of the HVIP catalog. So um, if an aftermarket carb certified upfit, which is a repower, um, is currently got an executive order, but and is a it is upfitted into a used market, because that's what those aftermarket EOs are. Are you saying then that because they're not listed on HFIP, that they're not eligible then, period? I'm not sure I totally understand the question. So I, let me, can I say, Lisa, I mean, this sort of early concept. So I think that's valuable feedback you're giving us. And I think we would need to have more of a discussion and consider it more. Um, okay, so I'll and, give some feedback. Oh, and, right, and then I think, I mean, part of it, as we develop a potential program is how do we make it sort of simple and straightforward to use, but yet capture as many uses as possible, right? Um, and so my, I would say you heard sort of Nikki, our initial thought is, hey, you need to be eligible on the HVIP um, list, um, probably at some point, like when it was first sold. Um, 
because we don't want to just sort of see anything necessarily just off the street that somebody has put electric motor in and batteries in as well. And you get in those fine delineations, as you say, with the aftermarket parts and aftermarket certifications. That's sort of my okay. initial thought. Okay. Oh, well, thanks for your initial thoughts. I'll give my um, comment then to that. I think that as we move into this innovative nascent space still, right? Really trying to support um, this truck space, which this program does so well. Um, my thoughts is, is that we do have executive orders that are established by CARB and go through a process that's pretty rigorous, um, not easy. And there's obviously super, super, super limited. I think you've only got two right now, but I think that you're gonna find that that could serve a great purpose in this market. I don't know how you could move it forward, but I think since the pilot, I don't think we'd be having these discussions today if you guys didn't open up the rental and the leasing for short term, if you didn't have ISIF. Um, and my thoughts are there's another another approach that could be considered and it would require obviously discussion, but I think that it could be a market that under CARB executive orders um, um, with repowers could be a great fit because some of these trucks have continuous life. And if they were updated with a CARB executive order, they're still expensive. They're not inexpensive. And so it's just the thought of getting us over the curb. One of the things I see as an issue in the standard procedures through HFIP is super, super, super long lead time. <laughs> and so this, I think, could be another approach and could be another market, especially when we've got useful life um, mandates coming up. And I just I just think you guys are at this brick, brick of changing um Many things you guys do so well, but at the same time, you're so innovative. So it's just a thought on that. And then I'll move on from that and go into the cap limits. Um, so be before you move on from that, oh. I just want, no, that's fine. I just wanted to point out that I don't want to give the impression that we are ready to develop that program. And kind of as, as both Brandon and, and Nikki, I think, have alluded to and, and Brianna, we're just teeing this up that's something we're thinking about. So there'll be a lot more opportunities if if we move ahead with it. Um, there'll be a lot more opportunities to uh, to give us comment and to work on this with us because it is it's it's preliminary. It's very pre preliminary at this point. Okay, well that's helpful. I think it's excellent. I mean, there's a huge used market out there, and it's perfectly for it's perfectly fit for the small um, fleet customer, which is really I think your target most of what ISIS about. So. Um, but my other comments had to do with the cap limits, um, on the qu question first, uh, you had, but I don't seem to see much, much language on it, even though you had it last year in your work group meeting and it, I, but there's no data for it is the OEM at 30%. Is that existing? What is the data from last year on it? Let's start with a question on that or as, as it relates to cap limits. Thank you. Yeah, Brittany, can you share some numbers with us on that? Um, I'm gonna have to pull some numbers. I don't think we had an OEM that exceeded the 30% last year, um, but yes, that's still going to be in place for this year. But we're certainly open to obviously, you know, feedback um, regarding that. So, so then I do want to, I do want to focus on that one since, um, since I'm not clear on it, other than the 30%, I assume is a dollar amount. Is that correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. And so my thoughts are, I think it's, this is just thinking this through in my head right now. I haven't analyzed it. So is that 30% for a class 2B um, is going to allow I don't know, thousands of vehicles compared to a class eight that's, mm -hmm. you know, $300,000 voucher compared to a, a $7,000 voucher. So it's just a thought of, of of fairness. I don't know if that's fair or if it's unfair, but I just think the 30% is loosey-goosey as it relates to fairness. Um, and the rebate cap, I personally love, love, love the idea on the removal of, of it for innovation because you do have other equipment. You do have um, a process when you start coupling up a class eight with 
Drage, with um, Small Fleet, with DAC. It's, you know, you're getting, you could get upwards of, of $500,000 and some of the price tags on the vehicles aren't even that much. And so it'd be really great if we could find some way to support um, the process of these other equipments and, and consider how, for example, how insurance and tax with federal excise tax, oh God, you can give the truck away for free, but by the time you add in, um, you know, on a, let's call it a $500,000 price truck, a, a price of a truck, you got $50,000 in sales tax. You got 50, 50 probably $60,000 in federal excise tax. Um, and then your DMVs is probably another 5,000. So you still have over $120,000 on a truck price, even if you gave the truck away for free. And that's really hard for small fleets, um, completely different than used markets, which don't have federal excise tax um, that have maybe, you know, a fourth of that price tag to begin with. So sales tax is different. DMV fa taxes are different and insurance is different. So I think removing this is critical for this project as it relates to innovation and ISIF. Um, and I think the provider cap um, um, should be increased. I think they've got a great market for ISIF, but it's pretty limited. Um, and those are my thoughts. Yes, thank you for sharing. Um, Lisa, we yeah, go ahead, Brandon. Uh, just a couple of quick thoughts. Um, one in, in the current I am, the 30% limit is only for the first 30 days of a potential of an opening. Um, oh. But since it's been ongoing and our intention is not to close, I think we'll we'll have to put a little bit of thought about that transition as we implement the new I am and over the next few in the next few months potentially, um, what that would look like. But the idea was really that you know any one manufacturer wouldn't come in and gobble up all the vouchers right off the bat. Um, but it was only an incentive for the first three days. And then the second part is there is a twenty vehicle provider cap. Uh, but that was also a soft cap and, and going over that limit was on a case by case basis. And, and that's just because we weren't entirely sure what we were going to see come through initially. And we wanted to just make sure, again, that one one potential um, stakeholder didn't use up all the vouchers at once. Um, but we've also really not run into that issue either as well. So those are just my initial thoughts responding to that. But they're, they're good comments. And we have played as we've been developing the zero emission loan program. We've definitely been looking at that 90% limit and looking at the sales and excise taxes and the registration fees and trying to figure out sort okay. of how, how far these programs go with those those amounts left over. So we've definitely been thinking about it as well. Well, that's helpful. It's so helpful. I guess I'll give um some 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 feedback on on or the comments related to the feedback on the provider. Um, you know, I think what's happened in for us, you know, when I when I say us dealers and and potential good providers that would fit this market. You know, they've strayed away from it, right? Because th this small fleet and this whole process is cumbersome administratively. Um, it's just tough. I, don't, I just don't know how to explain. It's just tough. It's interesting being on the side of the fence now and, and trying to directly deal with customers. Um, so my thoughts are is that I think I think the providers need to be a bigger part of your solution. Um, and until there's a, a pathway forward for them, I think your agreements um, on your terms and conditions don't support rentals, don't support short-term rentals, short-term leases. It's making people stay away um, because those things need to be fixed um, to get it right. You've got everything related to three years and beyond three years in your terms and conditions. And until you improve that, you've got people that don't feel comfortable because it's going to create a bad experience because it, they're not going to sign it. They're not comfortable signing it. And I wouldn't either. But anyway, so it's just some thoughts. I think it's a market that you guys are missing right now, even though you you um, allow it and it's not getting used for those some of those reasons. Um, let me say one thing, Brittany, feel free to jump in. We, we, we had a situation in, in last year um, with how could we sort of have a provider cater to short-term rentals and, and part of the language in the IM, I believe it's not this a vehicle needs to be in a fleet at least 200 days per year. Um, so there is some flexibility in there, but it's a, it's a little bit nuanced. Maybe that's an area we can look at to try to clarify and make it more useful. Brittany? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I was just going to reiterate that, Brandon, is that, um, you know, ISEF, 
that's kind of really its sole purpose is to cater to these innovative solutions, these short-term rentals, leases. I mean, you can even do a one-day rental, two-day rental, month-to-month, six months, um, you know, offerings that are not offered in HVIP. Um, But yeah, right now it is that we require the vehicle to at least be with the small fleet for at least 200 days out of the year. And then what you guys can look at, though, is your terms and conditions when you're signing your you're signing forms. The terms and conditions specifically don't support a rental or a short term lease at all. You're asking people to sign and register and commit to things for three years. And so it's impossible for an end user that's not responsible for a truck for one day or one month to feel comfortable being obligated to terms and conditions Um that they're signing. And so that's where we can't get, we as a dealer, as an example, realize we're gonna end up at a crossroads with a customer and it doesn't do us any good to create a brand for ourselves that falls short of providing a good service because the program doesn't support what they say it supports. Yeah, absolutely. We we had to go through last year and, and update the terms and conditions and, and sort of navigate them away from standard age for terms and conditions, the better fit ISAP. But I definitely hear hear what you're saying. And, I, and we should continue to have some further discussions about how we can make them fit ISAP's intent a little bit better because we definitely have some flexibility there. Um, so I think that's good feedback. Okay. Um, um, let's go ahead. Uh, I have uh, uh, Danny Ruano. Uh, let me go ahead and unmute, unmute yourself. Uh, go ahead and state your name and affiliation. Uh, yes. Um, good morning. My name is Danny Ruano um, over at Velocity Truck Centers. Uh, just want to make sure. So I understand that public agencies are now um, allowed to apply for ISEP, which is great. Um, but I know for a private fleet, I believe the cap, um, there's a cap, I think it's like 30 uh, vouchers that they could get per year, if I'm not mistaken. I know it's 50 for drainage. Um, do the same rules apply for the public agencies? or is it pretty much free for all for them? Thank you, yeah. Brittany, does the provider cap apply to public agencies as well in terms of the 30? So I'll jump in for clarification, the 30 voucher cap in HVIP, right? That's for straight purchases, which are no longer gonna be done within ISAF. They're gonna be done over in standard HVIP. So all the standard HVIP rules apply. now, I, the second part of this is that I actually do not know if the 30 voucher cap applies to public agencies. I'd have to go check our implementation manual for that. But just keep that in mind. If you're doing straight purchases, those things are no longer in ISEF. You still get the double voucher, but we're just not calling it ISEF anymore. It's now all in HVIP. Um, but if you are a public agency that does want to use ISEF and some of these innovative models like rentals or truck as a service or uh, some different lease structures, um, then you would be subject to the to the regular ISEF rules, which is uh, five trucks per five trucks or buses per fleet per year. So you said it's so for public agencies using ISEF is max um, five uh, vehicles per year. Yes, ISEF rules are five per year, um, and that's. Again, just a reminder, ISEF is for the innovative stuff, the rentals, the leases, and all of those other things. If the, if that public agency just really wants to do a standard purchase or um, a lease that's more than three years, again, that goes into regular HVIP. That's regular HVIP rules, which, as you said, I think is a 30 voucher cap. Okay. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Right. And Nick, Nikki, it's still the five. Um, it's still small fleet. It still has to be a public agency with 20 vehicles or less. Yes. Right. Yeah. So five vehicles is still a lot of vehicles for uh, a fleet with only 20 vehicles. Well, that's debatable, but okay. I don't see any other uh, hands up. Um, We'll give it a couple of minutes. I don't see anything. Brandon, if you want to go and maybe go ahead and... um, you have the last couple of slides and we'll yeah. give people a moment to think about what they've heard. Yes, it's the next couple of slides. Thanks, Nikki. Okay. 
So now we'll go over the timeline. When it comes to our talent, when it comes to our timeline, we expect that after we discuss our proposed implementation changes today, we will update the ICEF implementation manual and then release it by the end of March. We will solicit new providers for innovative strategies and product and conduct dealer training in April. ICEF will remain open and new funds will become available for requests in May. So as of May 1st of 2024, the voucher requests that are submitted will have to follow the new implementation manual. And then the next slide, we're still good on time. So we can continue on to more questions and comments before wrapping up today. I do see a raised hand. Yeah. Um, and just to follow up what we said earlier, here's uh, some good contact emails if you need to, if you want to send us a note after you've thought about it. Say, Lisa, let me go ahead and uh, get you on mute. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, Lisa, Tom Struck Center. Um, so I have a question on the dates that you said. Um, can you can you elaborate on the March 1st? I'm not clear on the rules and then the opening date, or is that an opening for vouch? providers i'm just not clear yeah so to clarify on the may may 1st date um isaf will not close it will remain open but new funds will become available in may so as of may 1st of this year the you'll you'll need to um follow the implementation manual at the time the new one so is then, the new oh go ahead sorry so, so that we're going to take our everyone's suggestions today and the proposals and then make updates to the impl implementation manual, which we expect to be released at the end of March. And then from there, we'll go on to offering um, trainings and searching for new providers. So then in May is when the new funding for this fiscal year becomes available, the $14.3 million I had mentioned earlier. Okay, so I guess why I'm confused, you guys in your notification sent out that on January 21st, there was a new appendix. So is that going to change again? Or I'm just trying to, I'm trying to follow your communication. Yes. Brittany, um, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was going to hop in here. So the appendix that was updated back on January 1st um, was more so due to the funding updates that occurred on 11-17. So the small fleet definition, um, and then we went in, went ahead and added in um, buses and public fleets. Not much has changed since then. Um, so we will be taking, like Bram said, all of these suggestions and feedback from today, and then we'll be releasing a new IM toward the end of March. Does that help, Lisa? Okay, yeah, that that that's clear now. I was just getting confused. Okay, so um, and then the IM when you guys are referring to the IM because it's again easily misinterpreted. You're using the Appendix F as it relates right. to the topic um, and meetings associated with ISF and not the HF HVIP IM. Correct. Correct. Yes. Okay. And then is the HVIP twenty twenty four IM manual going to be updated and if so when because last year it took very 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 long <laughs> i think the projection for that is sometime in april um and each book will also be hosting a work group here soon and that those dates will be that date will be released very soon okay i have one last question um going back beyond what you were just talking about with the timeline but just to circle back on a question I had in the first segment related to the results. I want to get clarity under the financing number of 53. Does the financing number fall under um, innovation or does it fall under standard? Um, I know you've got the 357 for standard, but I'm just trying to get clarity. I'm trying to put a circle around the categories and I'm assuming that Lisa's Reynolds trucks of the service and providers is innovation and, and standard purchases are standard purchases. I'm just not sure we're financing lands. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nikki, can you go back to, I believe slide four? 
with the project breakdown. Uh, next, um, yeah, fit. is this the slide you're yeah. referring to? Yeah, where does the financing land? Is that standard or is that under innovation? Okay, uh, Brittany, can you define the financing uh, requirements? Yeah, so financing, these numbers were pulled from the innovative track. What What is financing? Can you define what what kind of deal is a financing deal and does it fall under innovation? It does. So essentially, um, if we've got a provider that's offering the opportunity to help finance the vehicle at a comparable cost of, you know, a diesel vehicle, then yes, that is innovative. Um, they could offer financing rates that are less than um, 36 months. Um, you know, HVIP is the, the 36 months. So um, this and trucking as a service has always been kind of a very open-ended definition under, in, under ISF because everyone kind of has a little bit of a different definition of what the two are. Um, but yeah, we've seen quite a few of the, the financing offerings in ISF. So then on the financing, again, just so I'm clear, I'm assuming that if it's going to stay in ISF, that it couldn't be over 36 months. Am I wrong in that statement or can you clarify please? um yeah so it doesn't mean that it can't be longer than 36 months um obviously if you're going to have a deal that's going to be 36 months or longer you know that can go over into each bit but what we have been seeing though it's been less than 36 months okay so the, can you give me can you give me an illustration of a financing deal So again, um, if you've got a provider that is, you know, offering the cost of the vehicle to the customer at a discounted rate and they're helping to offset, you know, and finance the vehicle at a, you know, on a 12 month term versus a 36, again, that falls under ISEF because it's less than the 36 months. I don't know, Nikki, if you have a better like illustration that you can help me out with on this one. No, I think I was just going to say that, you know, we're happy to have a another offline call with you, Lisa, and, and look through some of the stats off the top of my head. I can't think of a good illustration of any specific one. Yeah, just because you guys have got 53, so I'm kind of curious um, if it provides an interesting opportunity that maybe even we as dealers or providers are not exploring and just understanding it, because if it obviously supports something Beyond 36 months, I find that interesting and would love to understand what types of deals um, are being approved in financing um, because many dealers have financing arms. And so the goal here for me is to understand what is approvable and redeemable in the ISA program. So I'd like to have an offline call. Yeah, I think you, you highlight an important point though, we did have lots of providers in the first couple of rounds who thought that um, that 36 month uh, definition was a max and it's not. Uh, you can definitely do any of these uh, rentals, leases, truck as a service agreements for more than 36 months wow. under ISEF. Um, but I think also strategically speaking now, most people are trying to make these fit into a more standard HVIP 36 month plus lease structure, just because as I mentioned, the pot of funding is much larger on the HVIP side. Um, the stacking rules, for those of you who've been paying very close attention, are slightly different in that, in fact, uh, the double voucher plus stack enhancements, et cetera, end up being a slightly higher on the HVIP side. So we do see lots of providers who may have been doing um, more activity in ISEF now sort of moving to standard HVIP and fitting into that standard 36 month lease financing or purchase agreement. Um, but again, the flexibility is available. The reason why this is you know available is so that small fleets can find out what works for them best, right? If, if you have a small fleet who is you know not credit worthy, is constantly being declined, cannot figure out how to like get their own insurance or install their own chargers, then finding a provider who can help them solve for all of those problems and then bill them at a monthly rate 
uh, is, you know, the type of innovation that we we really hope to look for and spur in, in this category of set aside. Wow, I think that's all good. That was a great, a great um, elaboration on what you guys' intention are, because I don't think that I am or any of the language and narratives associated around documents. Um, and even for me being pretty, pretty long um, following this process, don't they have not heard it said that way. And maybe it's all just lessons being learned that are bringing more clarity for all of us. But I really think that this could be a great, great, great opportunity for dealers and providers because, you know, trying to trying to trying to put something around a short term agreement for vehicles that are expensive and you got to and the provider is going to take on all the tax costs. Right. They can pass on a portion of that. But the goal is to get someone in the vehicle at a parity cost on a monthly basis to trying to find that without any terms um, to guarantee that. Is, is tough and the residual values come into play or the depreciated value. Anyway, so it's hard to figure out how everyone eliminates some risk for themselves um, while trying to provide adoption for customers. Um, so I would personally, Vicky, Nikki, I would like to have an offline call when you guys have available because I think this is something I need to learn. And I would like to get my a department of, of at our in our um, organization involved because I think there's more that we could do that we're just not capturing. Please. Yeah. Yeah. And but I'll say it again here on the work group with others listening because it's important just to keep in mind that you know what's what's innovative about ISEF is that it it's it has this third party, this provider that HRIP has never allowed, right? HRIP has always had very straightforward rules that said there's a purchaser, there's a dealer, and there may be a leasing or financing person sort of in between that. But those are all the people that are allowed to be in the transaction for, for a standard HRIP voucher. So just keep in mind that what's innovative about ISEF is not that it's short term. We do allow short term stuff. What's innovative about ISEF is that it has a, a third party, this provider that's doing something different in the transaction that would not have normally been allowed, but we're going to allow it and make it possible here in ISEF because we think that small fleets need that additional support and service. Thank you. Let me go ahead, Marissa Brown, let me go ahead and unmute you. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you for this presentation. Um, and thinking about equity, oh, again, <clears throat> Marissa Brown. Uh, Sorry. Oh, you got muted there. I accidentally it. muted her. I was trying to mute Lisa. Hang on a second. Okay, can you hear me now? There we go. Sorry about that. No worries. Uh, Marissa Brown, Transportation Equity Program Manager with the Green Lining Institute. Um, thank you for this presentation um, and thinking about equity and accessibility for small businesses and small fleet owners. I think it would be really helpful to provide more transparency on lease and like rental or financing terms uh, for fleets and any interest paid. Since this is such a nascent technology, I think there really needs to be some guardrails and protections for consumers around leasing and renting these newer vehicles to be sure that folks, you know, don't default on payments. Um, does CARP have any guardrails around this? One of the one of the basic premises that we've as we've been implementing ISEP is they the a provider has to demonstrate the voucher benefit to the end user. And so as we've seen some of those service agreements, we've definitely gone through and looked to see how is that to make sure that voucher is applied and they're seeing the benefit. Uh, so that's sort of a sort of a high level uh, piece of, of protection that we've been definitely doing. Yeah, and the only other item I would mention is we do say that we would like to see payments that are comparable to uh, what an ICE vehicle would have cost that fleet. But as Brandon mentioned, it's a high level guidance because prices for both ICE and ZAZ have fluctuated quite a bit and whether or not that package includes fuel can change that monthly cost significantly as well. So we have high level guidance, but not like specific set interest rates. Right, Marissa, and then- Can I ask you that what, what, what would you, what might be some examples that you would see that okay. we could include? Um, sorry, can you first define like benefit? What does that mean? Oh, oh, so like um, 
if let's say you have the the MSRP of the vehicle and um, it's going to be paid for, say, over three years or five years, we would want to see the voucher applied off the, the that capital cost, and then you would have the remaining finance be over. You know, say if it was five hundred thousand dollars and you took off two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars, just for an example, right? That we'd see the finance based on two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars would be one just sort of a simple example. Yeah, and another example would be, you know, Brittany had gone through some of the new requirements on the service agreement, but it's always been true that the service agreement that that small fleet signs at the end has to show within it, within the pricing breakdown, that the full voucher amount is being passed on to them, right? We we don't want to see rental agreements where the rental company has used the voucher, but then not shown that the voucher is actually discounting the monthly rental rate to the fleet. Okay, thank you so much for that clarification. Um, and happy to keep talking um, offline about this because um, I have a couple partners who are like talking to me about kind of like industry standards for um, rental agreements for these Zev trucks. And I'm like, I can't provide you any information for these standards because it's such a new technology. So I think there's definitely some opportunity for CARB to be the leader on like setting guardrails for this. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Brett. Seems we have another question. Lisa? No, um, let's go oh, to cool. James Tong. He's been waiting for quite a while. That's okay. Yeah, of course. James, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hey, hi. Thanks. Uh, James Tong again. Uh, a couple of questions. I want to follow up on Nikki's comment about um, the mechanism on HVIP. She said something like the HVIP standard, if you have a three year lease, is slightly more generous. And I'm, I'm not sure, I'm cl unclear how it's more generous because I, I thought it was the same double up bonus and the same DAC bonus. So if you could clarify that. And then the second part of the question is if, if a fleet has, say, 10 vehicles, Right. Well, one of 10 vehicles. Can the fleet say take five from ICEF and then five from HVIP standard, provided that the lease meets is a three year lease or something like that? Or are they subject to just five across the board? No, the cap is only within ICEF. So uh, if a small fleet wanted to, um, you know, rent five ZEV trucks, they could do that using ICEF because that's the only place that rentals are allowed. And then, you know, if a little bit into it, they say, you know, these five rentals I have are working out great. I think they actually want to purchase five trucks. Um, they, or or even more than that, because there is not a cap on the standard HVIP side. They could go over to HVIP and then place an order for seven, eight, or nine vehicles using HVIP. So um, again, the cap is just on the ISF side. And um, your other question, oh, was about how those things stack up. Yeah, sorry, I'm getting a little bit into inside baseball here, but uh, we do have a voucher calculator that we're happy to walk you through. It's um, it's just that the the base voucher in HVIP, the DAC is then calculated on the base, whereas in ISEF, we we had originally set it up slightly differently so that the um, the base voucher gets a DAC plus up and then it gets doubled. It it doesn't work out to that big of a difference, but we have noticed that people are are taking notice and and sometimes changing their purchase arrangements. But oh, we can... I got it. So can you just make sure I understand? So basically, under H for standard, if you have the DAC bonus, it'll be applied to the the double the amount, not the base amount. So for example, a, a class three vehicle, you have it'll be ninety thousand dollars, and you get a fifteen percent on the ninety thousand dollars rather than. 15% on the $45,000 under ISEF. Is that correct? You got it. Okay. Um, and, and then for the DAC bonus, is it still 20 vehicles or less for the standard HVIP or is it 10 vehicles or less? That's part of the confusion that we've had. Yeah, I believe that the change in the small fleet definition is universal. Okay. Is that, is that right, Brittany? So all everybody on the HVIP side is 20 or less now, right? Correct. Yes. Thanks. And then just one, just kind of a, a suggestion, you know, some of the small fleet, actually many false fleets park their vehicles at home or have, or the employees park. I know the manual says 
it, it, they allow for exceptions as provided you provide a letter, but it's unclear what is even needed in the letter or or it's like, what or what are you looking for? So I think we had a lot of back and forth on that, on what is a proper letter. So if you provide guidance on that, on when can someone park, get a voucher that's parked at a residence, that would be helpful. Thank you. That's very important feedback. It is a it is definitely a situation we've seen multiple times, and we'd like to know what tools we can give folks to make their applications smoother and easier. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, let me go ahead. Uh, Lisa, we'll get to you in a moment. Let me do uh, David Leoachi. Let me go ahead and let me go ahead and unmute yourself and give your name and affiliation. Okay. Uh, there you go. My name is uh, Dave Bayoki. I am with Ethero Truck and Energy out of Stockton, California. And uh, I, I just want to kind of coattail on, on what the last speaker had to say about addresses. Th this is a, uh, especially, it, it doesn't matter whether it's HBIP or ISA, it's a continuing irritation for Tech to Tech and for us, we don't know where they're going to verify addresses. Uh, and um, with a small fleet, um, it seems like the, the, the standard is you need a three-year lease. Most small fleets operate from home. And, and then they, they, their domicile is basically a truck park. They they have a they have a a month to month rental truck park where they keep their seven trucks or five trucks and they operate the the, the mailing address from home. But according to the the, the regulations that, that you have, every one of those has to go case by case, and I have to get a uh, a waiver from CARD for every single one of them and. It's just that the nature of that small fleet business is the same in every case. And almost every single uh, in-process voucher request that I have uh, is, is being held up by this uh, the, these address verifications. Uh, I wanted to know if there's any change in the wind, wind for that, uh, if you understand that that's how that a particular market operates. Uh, and if I can look forward to any change in that, or am I just going to have to slog through it? I can respond, but we discussions we've had, I think Nikki or Brittany are probably closer connected to it. Yeah, I'll just kind of chime in here, David. Um, so like Nikki said, some of these things that these small fleets face, like parking at their house and not necessarily having a three year, you know, agreement um, have definitely come to light in the last couple of months. It is something that we are working very closely on. Um, David, I'll connect with you offline um, just regarding some that you have in process. So uh, we look to the future to being able to kind of maybe set some better parameters and guidelines um, around those within ISEF and just making the whole processing of the voucher a bit easier. But just want to fully acknowledge that we do see it um, and we're working on a process to definitely um, make it a little bit better and easier. Okay. Thank you. Let me add to, you know, it's, there's there's always a balance in a program, right? Of like preventing like waste, fraud and abuse uh, and, and protecting the public funds with also keeping it efficient. And so as Brittany said, it's definitely been a discussion in the last few months. Uh, as we have been reviewing those case by cases and um, trying to make sure that, that things are things are all sort of on board, but um, I think that's a good good comment that we'll bring over. Um, Lisa, let me jump over uh, to you. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay. Um... Oh, there we go. Okay. There we go. We have, couldn't find it. Um, all right. So I have two comments that were triggered. Um, it's a standard agreement. Um, I want to get some clarity 
on on complement can you elaborate on the complementary services i think currently right now i want to make sure i'm clear you know we have leases that we're doing for customers in the standard which are um could i guess the other be the trucks as service or a standard lease um generally speaking is beyond the 36 months and of course these are service requirements related to isif and in those other, which is why I'm bringing this question up for clarity, um, you are really more requiring information, like you already expressed, that the truck um, be disclosed with the rebate amount and making sure that everything's disclosed within that agreement. Um, and in some of those services, like trucks as a services, we're not, we're, we're coming up with an aggregated amount um, I want to make sure that you're you're not going down a new pathway for is this isolated to ISIF as it relates to complementary services and your request for what is in there and disclosed? And can you elaborate on that specifically relating to a description and or itemized cost? Yes, thank you, Lisa. Did you have another question? Yeah, I'm going to, but if we can go with this one first, it'll help me yeah. elaborate um, and follow up. Um, Nikki, can you move to slide 12, please, to go over the service agreements? And I, I'll just pop in here and say that service agreements are specifically related to ISEF to Innovative Solutions, Lisa, not standard purchases through HVIP. Um, the service agreement requirements came about uh, just due to some confusion with what needs to be uploaded um, with the original request and what PO between who and, and so on and so forth. So the way that it stands now is that um, the initial request, there needs to be a purchase order between the provider and the dealer. Um, that's all that, that needs to be done in order to get through the process. And then later on, um, as it gets closer to redemption, we need to see some sort of service agreement that outlines these following bullet points that is between the provider and the end user. Again, we just want to make sure that the cost, that the incentive is being passed along to that small fleet. Um, and again, this is a guide. You know, we're, we're still figuring out what um, is working on the provider end and what is working on the um, end user end. So again, just a guide here for um, what providers can possibly start to put in some of their service agreements. Okay, all right, okay. Um, then I wanna move on to specifically that I'm gonna try to give um, a reason, another reason for considering uh, the removal of the 90% of the truck price. When I do an analysis of uh, the rebate calculations, and I'm gonna use the class eight as an example, you know, obviously it's just straightforward math. Um, the ISEF is less than the standard um, for a small fleet and or a small fleet with pull up. So um, I'm gonna use the standard small and DAC as an example. And we've got 120 plus 120 plus 36 on the DAC. We end up at 276. Um, and then we end up at 270 um, on the standard with ISEP, which is 120 plus 120 plus 18 because the DAC is not compounded. And then if we move on to the standard with POLA, you've got 225. So I just want to kind of, and then if I go into the fuel cell, um, I end up at 516 in the standard versus ISEF, I end up at 378. Um, and then with pole, I end up at um, at three, it's got all the way up to 640 in a fuel cell. But so my point is the ISEF is actually less um, financial benefits. Um, and so um, I just wanna make sure that you guys are clear on that because it's just a math problem. So I just continuously think that as we try to find ways to support these limits that the 90% in this particular innovation could move over to the dealers or the providers taking on some of these costs. And I think this should be removed because they could couple it with components that could really support um, the investment side for the, and user versus being stuck with all this tax stuff and 
other things that maybe could be offset if we have if we don't have this off this 90% cap because the rebates allow it. Um, but anyways, that's just my point trying to make sure that you guys give um, more consideration towards removing that um, cap for, for ISEF this year. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, it's definitely something we've considered and we'll apply it going forward as we take in the suggestions. I mean, Brittany, Nikki, is there anything you'd want to comment on that? No comment from me, but thank you for the feedback. Yeah, definitely. That's, I mean, this is why we have this work group. So we really appreciate it, Lisa. Thank you. Uh -huh, thanks. Yeah, it's good. It's good feedback. Um, I have one more hand that just came up and I know we're starting to get uh, close to our scheduled time. Uh, I see April Rosenquist. Let me go ahead and unmute you. Go ahead and unmute yourself uh, and give your name and affiliation, please. Thank you. My name is April Rosenquist. I'm with EV Choice. And uh, two things. First, I'd like to second the comment about the address verification. Um, that's been a real pain. And uh, I have had to, to tell people they don't qualify because they don't have a commercial place they park their vehicle. Um, second, I'm sorry. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, second, I am still confused on the drage and the port of LA port of long beach. Um, uh, plus up, I guess you call it. Um, cause the email on November 17th said that they they now can, uh, apply that money with ISEF, but you're, I think if I heard you correctly, you're saying, no, you can't apply the up to a hundred thousand dollars from the port with ISEF is, which is it? Yeah. Brittany, go ahead. Yeah. So I'm not sure um, where maybe the confusion was in that. There was a lot a lot happening, a lot of updates <laughs> in a very short period of time. So, um, but just to reiterate, April, um, POLA, B, POLA and POL B cannot be applied in ISIF. So anything innovative, I think it can only be applied in standard H, but for small fleets. And I think sometimes where the confusion lies is that ISIF, um, a while back used to fully encompass the standard purchases and the innovative solutions. And 1117, we split that off. So probably still some floating terminology out there that makes it a little bit confusing. Um, but to just kind of set it in stone, uh, Pola, Long Beach, and Port of LA funding cannot be stacked within ISEF, any sort of innovative um, voucher request. Okay, but if it's a standard... Um purchase, then they can still get the double voucher plus the POLB? It, yes, exactly. Okay. That that answers my question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Brianna, I don't see any other hands raised. Oh, here we go. Lisa, go, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I have, I have one clarifying question for the cap, does the cap take effect right now or is it taking effect in May for this soft cap at, at 20 fleet sizes? I thought I understood it was gonna take effect immediately. Am I correct or not? Yeah, Lisa, we'll, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Lisa, we'll, we'll get back to you um, about that one offline. Okay. I don't see any other hands up. Okay. Yes, we can go on to the last slide and wrap up. Okay, so um, we want to go ahead and thank everyone for participating today. You have provided very valuable feedback, and we definitely hear your suggestions and look forward to implementing, at, implementing them as we make changes to the implementation manual. So here are my, here's our contact information. If you'd like to reach us directly, we'd be happy to hear um, more proposals and feedback in the future. And um, we wanna wish you a lovely rest of your day.
Thank you.